Hi, Gary Stearman here. Time for another edition of Prophecy in the News. Today's special guest, L.A. Marzulli, and we've got something important to share with you today. And I do mean important. L.A. Marzulli, good to have you here. Great to be here, Gary. Thanks. You know, you're carrying a kind of a burden these days. Uh, we have followed L.A.'s travels. You've shared your adventures with us. You've gone to Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, really done what I consider basic research into the genetic Thank history you. of mankind. And your books on the trail of the Nephilim have uh, really basically become classics. But in the process of doing this research, you, you have found yourself coming up against resistance in a lot of ways. Now, we have just come back from Newark, Ohio, uh, where Russ Dizdar, Ellie Marzulli, and myself uh, shared in the presentation of a program designed, to, I, I think, to sensitize people to the idea that there were once giants. The Bible refers to the Nephilim. And let's start our story right there because we've got a lot to talk about today. Sure, ab absolutely. And, and it, what was great about the conference is the way your presentation sort of anchored the, the conference. I mean, and you did it from a, a biblical perspective and it was, it was almost an exhaustive presentation. What I mean by that is you really covered so much material and you only had two hours, but you covered just a wealth of material and presented it in such a way that people could see that, my gosh, this is sort of the key to end time prophecy in a way. And you enabled Russ to take off from your, your platform and, and I was able to take off from what you laid down. So it was and the uh, platform really good. Basically is this, that there is something in the Bible that's an extraordinarily important topic that's been mostly ignored. And, and let me just give you an example to start with here. Genesis 14, uh, this is the narrative in which Abraham goes to the land mm -hmm. that God showed him. He says, go down there, I've got something I want you to do. And Abraham went, by the, at that time he was called Abram. And in, in Genesis 14, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Kedilaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, four Gentile kings. Well, does that ring a bell? It does. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. This mm -hmm. is a foreshadowing of the prophetic history of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Those four Gentile kings decided that they wanted to come down along the Jordan River, and they came down along the east side of the Jordan River, L.A., on a mission mm -hmm. to capture the land. And in the sixth, uh, well, the fifth verse, let me read that. In the fourteenth year came Kedarlaomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth Karnaim and the Zuzims in Ham and the Amims in Shave Kiriataim. Those Gentile kings were on a mission to destroy giants. And the giants are the Amims. They are the Rephaim, they are the Zuzim, mm -hmm. three major branches of giants. Why did they want to do that? What was their mission? Well, if you read the Bible carefully, you find out uh, that their mission extends all the way through the days of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, all the way up to the kingdom of David. And yet, how often is this taught in church, this history of the giants? And it's a, not only is it not taught in church, but then we have those who are trying to tell us that there is no second incursion. That, well, they really, the Nephilim only happened before the flood and it didn't, we don't get a second, third, and fourth incursion. And yet, just a, just a cursory reading of Scripture shows us that the Rephaim are there, the Emims are there. And why would Moses, who is writing, you know, hundreds of years after the flood, why would he then in Genesis 6 tell us that the, son, that the Nephilim were on the earth? in those days and also afterwards. Why, right. if he was writing, you know, hundreds of years later, he would just write the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, period. Because that's those days, you know, he's, he's pointing back in, into, the, into the far distant past. But he says, and also afterward. And he's writing that hundreds of years after the flood. And he's telling us, 
and also afterward when the sons of God saw the daughters of of men and went into them. And that's the biblical sense of coitus. There's no way around that. Had children and these children were called the Nephilim. And what's so important about that is we see that there are different names for the tribes. As, as these four kings are going down, there are different Nephilim, generic term, but right. there are ne- different Nephilim tribes with different genetic characteristics. Exactly. Like the long necks, for instance. Exactly. Yeah, the Anakim, the long necks. And we come to the conclusion that there were uh, developed species of very, very large people. Now, as I mentioned at Newark, when you think of a giant today, you think of an anomaly. Uh, There are people who grow to be eight feet, nine feet tall, but they're always very sickly, and they don't live to be very old. They are the acromeglian giants uh, that you read about, and... Usually, you could walk up one of these guys and push him, and he'd fall over. They're they're spindly and weak, and so forth. And when we think of giants, we think of a pituitary problem. Not so in the Old Testament. Those giants were huge, uh, maybe in the range of thirty feet tall in some cases. And there's there's actual historic record keeping that reflects that, right? Yeah, there. It's specifically in, in the time in the days of Noah. That first incursion, the giants could easily have been 30, 35 feet tall. And that's hard for us to, to, to grasp. I mean, a being that large. And yet, apparently, according to some of the newspaper reports that come around in the, in the 19th century, uh, reports of very, very large skeletons. There's a lot of stuff on the net which shows these, these large skeletons. And most of those, are all of them, I would say, yeah. are Photoshop. And yet we, um, I'll, I'll just give you a, a little clue here. I, I sat down with a anthropologist and I can't even tell you the name of the city because I don't want to get this guy in trouble but it was a city somewhere in the United States and he told me that there was a construction project um, that was happening and he was called in uh, and they went very deep with the foundation and they found a very large femur bone and he told me that this femur bone if he went public with it would rewrite American history as we know it I said well why don't you do something why don't you go and and he was terrified and the reason why he's terrified is because he could lose his job, his tenure, I mean, everything, if he goes out and says what, what is really there. And so there's this fear in academia. And of course, you know, people say, oh, you're just making this up. Ben Stein's movie Expelled exposes this, that anyone who has a different, is operating under a different paradigm in Ben Stein's movie, it's creationism or actually just intelligent design, can lose their job, tenure, reputation. And we see this. And that, of course, is intellectual fascism. Why can't we go where the evidence leads us? If there really is a giant femur bone, and he said the thing was like close to four feet. Mm. Now that's, you know, here's, here's my femur bone. It's a little over, you know, 18, 19, 20 inches. You get something that's 48 inches. Now you're looking at uh, a being which is well over 20 feet. Yeah, a, a, a very, very, very huge being. And the interesting thing is, this is not the only instance of a giant skeleton having no. been found. I've, I myself have talked to people who have seen them. I've talked to one gentleman who was a, a pastor of a church and traveled through Arizona and saw a, the mummy of a giant, which has since, by the way, mysteriously it's been disappeared. been removed, yes, I'm aware and of that. That giant was estimated to be around 12 feet tall. Uh, it, it was a woman. And she was in a kneeling position, so you really couldn't tell how tall she would have been if she stood up. But they were saying 12, 13 feet tall. And, but she's not anywhere to be found now. And you've, ha- you've run into this yourself. Everywhere you go, people will say, well, there used to be such and such an artifact, but nobody knows where it went, right? Well, one of the, one of the interesting pictures, and this is my discovery, it will be an armature of a Nephilim volume two when it comes out in the fall. But basically, um, there is a man on Catalina who did primitive archaeological digs in the 1920s. His name was Ralph Glidden. And there was a cache of old photographs and records that was stored in the attic of the museum and had been there for like 70 years. And the curator, John Borgina, the former curator, found the trunk and I was able to look at the pictures. Mm -hmm. And what I found, and we've had four people with different computer programs looking at the photograph, and this is based on your suggestion, and based on the idea or the fact that Ralph Glidden was five foot eight inches tall, extrapolating the data from the picture, they're able to mm-hmm. ascertain that the giant, that, that skeleton in that picture is around nine feet. And that's just not normal. 
That's some all bets are off. There. And by the way, that was in your presentation at Newark. That's in, correct. In the Nephilim Mounds uh, correct. conference, which is in that DVD. I presented information on the biblical history of the giants, which is massive. I I didn't even scratch the surface, L.A. There's so much more. But as you said, I put a lot of detail in my study. A lot of detail. <clears throat> and and when you watch my study, and combined with your study and Russ's, there's the, you come to one conclusion, that that we are being duped. The real Bible story is all about genetics. It's mm -hmm. all about Satan's attempt to create a false uh, genetic being that would take over the world. Mm -hmm. When in fact God's plan was for humans to rise and for Christ to be born as a human being and, and as the Redeemer. And nobody wants to believe that. <laughs> and, and nobody wants to believe that there were... <clears throat> ulterior plans by Satan to corrupt the human move, race. Move, counter move. Russ Dizdar, one of Russ's presentations, which was incredible, talking about the backbreeding of the Third Reich, the Nazis right. in, in particular, and what they were after, and what they were trying to breed the Superman, and then he ties it into um, the, which has been documented, the, the, the birthing centers at, at Labersborn, where these women were um, out of wedlock, and they, they sired children, and there's, there's some of those, many of those children are still alive today, trying to get this, this perfect human being, this Superman. And yeah. so the Nazis knew about this. They also sent out um, uh, forces um, to go out and collect. They were trying to find remnants, artifacts of the Nephilim to get that, to somehow, as Russ talks about, backbreeding to create the superhuman, right. the super being. Hitler Incredible. himself wrote saying that he had had a vision. He said, I have seen the new man, mm -hmm. is what he called him. Mm -hmm. uh, and the new man, which also was called an Aryan, was, was giant, powerful, uh, had superior intelligence, so forth and so on. And he believed that, that out of his race would come the conquering race for the whole, for the whole planet. Terrible to behold. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so... This is what we're dealing with. This is the, shall we say, the competitor to the central narrative of the Bible. The central narrative of the Bible is that Adam and Eve were created, that there would be a battle between their uh, progeny mm -hmm. and the wicked progeny mm -hmm. all the way down to the time of the birth of Christ. And the battle raged around genetics. Well, I, I did another presentation <coughs> called The Seed of the Woman. And that, uh, I, the title I, actually that I spoke under was It's All About the Seed. And really the Bible is all about the seed. It's all seed about war. genetics. Sure, absolutely. And people have sort of thrown that particular subject aside and thrown away the detail that supports it. And that's where we come in. And we are trying to reestablish the biblical narrative. And I think you're doing a great job of it, by the way, by <laughs> going out and to. doing primary research because you're making people sit up and take notice. And, and it's good to do that. You know, part of what we're trying to do, too, is, is get genetic sampling or genetic samples, um, tissue samples out of Peru. We've been there. I've been there like three different times now. And we've got nine samples that are sitting in Peru and we're trying to get the paperwork and because there's all these hoops just to get this DNA stuff out, yeah. just to get the samples out to test. Um, testing, preliminary testing was done uh, on one sample that came from a man by the name of Lloyd Pye. This goes back three years before I had anything to do with it. And it, it, Lloyd got these samples out of Peru, and, and, and I've spoken to the geneticist numerous times now. And th the testing that was done on these showed that the, at certain segments, certain elements of the microchondrial DNA did not match anything in the genome. And, of course, that goes along with our hypothesis that... Nephilim tribes, when Joshua and Caleb came into the promised land, uh -huh. these Nephilim tribes, was, there was a diaspora. They began to flee for their lives because we know the mandate from a loving, holy God was to wipe these creatures out because they weren't human. Right. And some fled <clears throat> through, through uh, into, into Northern Europe, probably came to the Americas. Others built ships, sailed across the Atlantic. Thor Highway Law proved that with his book, Ra. You certainly can do that. Others perhaps went down to Africa. And we see very... Uh, in, in sort of enticing clues in all these areas with the giant uh, Native Americans talking about a race of, of giant men with red hair and six fingers which inhabited the land before they came and that's all in their oral history. 
So what's interesting is, is we see down in Peru, we see genetic anomalies and the DNA testing will show this. Um, and hopefully, b based on the test, the earlier testing, the microchondrial DNA did not match anything in the human genome, which again, bolsters our hypothesis and points to the biblical narrative as being the correct one, not the Darwinian paradigm. Probably the most uh, famous giant of all giants would be Goliath, mm -hmm. the Battle of David and Goliath, which, by the way, is a biblical theme. You know, Goliath representing all that's wrong with the world and David representing all that's right with the world. It's the Battle of the Redeemer versus the, uh, <clears throat> the nations, if you will. Goliath was of the Rephaim, one specific breed one of giant. Now, yep. and they had six fingers, by the way. He had four brothers that are mentioned in the Bible. It's, it's very, it's treated with great reality, a realistic appraisal of, of these giants. But what I want to get to is that <clears throat> these were not weaklings. They were very strong. Uh, Goliath's armor is described, and it weighs so much that ordinary man couldn't even pick it up. So we're not talking about weaklings. We are talking about very, very strong people, and they leave behind an architectural history, these megalithic structures. And I wanted to get into that just briefly because ancient megalithic structures are explained away by modern archaeology as well. We can't really remember. We, don't, we have no record of how those buildings were built, but they, they had techniques. Uh, they knew how to use levers and pulleys like we didn't use. But in reality, it was very strong, large people building those megalithic and structures. And you know, you talk about large, strong people, but we have to remember that these large, strong people are demonically enhanced. Yes. Because they're, part of their DNA makeup is from the fallen angelic beings. And, and these are, Greek mythos will tell us like Hercules, and I don't think that that's mythos. I think it's based on an oral tradition which is then handed down. Hercules is this powerful demigod, essentially. Yeah. And the Nephilim would be looked at um, as demigods. I mean, they were sure. powerful. Interestingly enough, when we were in uh, on the at the Nephilim Mounds Two conference, we had a surprise where this gentleman had an artifact which he had found uh, in Michigan, and this artifact was what we thought at first was a sword, mm -hmm. and that weighed seven and a half pounds, seven point five pounds. And I picked it up and showed it to the audience, and it was obvious that there's no way you can wield this as a sword. It's just way too heavy, thirty one inches long. And it was it would look like bronze and you could see it had been beaten and forged. I mean, it wasn't it certainly it, in my opinion, must be pre-Columbian. We're, we're trying to do testing on the artifact. But Chief Joseph Riverwind, who was with us and who said, guys, you're looking at it through your you know, cultural eyes. This isn't a sword. It's a lance. And the oral tradition of many Native American tribes talk about these giants, 9, 10, 11, 12 feet tall, would come in with these huge lances and they would run these lances through three braves, three men. And so Chief Joseph and myself and Bob Shelley all stood, you know, back to back kind of thing. Yeah. And then we held the lance in front of us. And sure enough, that lance, 31 inches, would easily pass through us. But what was interesting, and this came through an archaeologist who I, I showed him pictures of the lance and he got back to me on this. And he said, Ish B. Banab, one of the giants in the Bible, yes. spear weighed 300 shekels. His spear was, the spearhead weighed 300 shekels. When you convert to 300 shekels to pounds, you get 7.5 pounds, which is the exact weight mm. of the lance that we saw in Michigan. So is that like sort of the status quo or the standard? Did they make a lot of these? We don't know. That's why we're, that, you know, trying to get it tested. But the modern <clears throat> secular theology, if you will, is evolution. Sure where man evolved from lesser creatures, little apes got bigger and bigger and learned to stand up, and, and uh, finally they became Homo noeticus, the thinking ape that was able to solve problems and communicate and so forth, and out of that came human beings. Well, bunk. Uh, it Nonsense. is not true. Sure. And the common thread that runs all the way through the, the, the lore of the giants is not evolution, it is competition. There was another race in competition mm -hmm. with humanity. It goes all the way back to the story of Noah. Mm -hmm. 
And what's interesting, and, and we, you know, we've talked about this before, but they, with Noah, what we see is the eradication of pretty much everybody on planet Earth. Right. Because this, this, it's not a, if people look at the fallen angels coming down, oh, it's just a little frat party, it's a weekend deal. It's 400 to 450 years, perhaps even longer, where the fallen angelic beings are setting up and, and messing with the genome and creating the Nephilim. And everything is, is contaminated. And we can see that, that most, most High God takes the animals who are, not, who are still genetically pure, and, and, and it's, he's protecting the seed. And then that, that, that vetting process in my mind, where God says, Noah, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives, that in my mind is a vetting process. He's, and he does it in Genesis 6 and Genesis 7, and he's calling out specifically, Noah, you and your wife, your son, and your sons' wives, that's a vetting process. There's no Nephilim in that bunch there of those eight people. That's the whole point of protecting them and getting them into the ark and shutting them into the ark. And that's why the whole idea of the second, third, fourth incursion, the seed wars continue on the other side um, when Noah and his family go out and begin to repopulate the earth. And we see that with Nimrod, where he becomes Gabor and becomes Nephilim through ritualistic sex magic. And here's, I think, the bottom line. <clears throat> because in Matthew 24, and how many times have we quoted Jesus saying, as it was in the days of Noah? You know, people were giving, uh, marrying and giving in marriage, and, and everybody interprets that as, well, you know, it was normal life. People were farming, having kids, sure. marrying, getting married. It was just a normal lifestyle until you look at, at uh, Peter's comments, you know, the angels that left their first estate, Jude's comments. Uh, Jude quotes Enoch. When you go to the book of Enoch, Enoch talks Verbatim. about... Verbatim. The, the yeah, he does. And, and Enoch uh, talks about 200 angels that came down on Mount Hermon, Mount Hermon, the mountain of the oath. And they descended from there and they built giant megalithic structures. They, they did uh, some amazing things. Recorded, by the way, I think in Greek history, one of the examples I give is from Plato, who talked about a giant named Atlas, mm -hmm. who was the product of a, a god who married a human woman and had a mixed breed child. He was which called, is the Nephilim, essentially. Which is Nephilim. Yeah, absolutely, all day now, long. Now, Plato talks about this as though it actually happened. And he said, you know, um, Atlas built the city uh, th that was called Atlantis. Which was destroyed, says Plato, in the great flood of Deucalion. Oops, we call it the great <laughs> flood. We call it the great flood of Noah. Sure, but the story is the same, and it's it's being covered up, and that's where you come in, and and you and Russ and others are yourself, obviously, and, and myself are working to try to bring this to light. I think mm. understanding what the, what happens in Genesis six and the idea of a seed war is is central to any understanding of, of biblical eschatology. Why do I have trouble saying it? That's okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you. A biblical eschatology, because without understanding the seed war, when we get to statements like Jesus, who are, who's warning us, it'll be like the days of Noah, we right. have no clue what he's talking about. Yeah. No clue at all. So it's, it's vital for any serious student of the Bible to understand what happened in Genesis 6. And, you know, when Paul talks about the rapture of the church, the blessed hope, what does he, what does he do in uh, 1 Corinthians 15? gives this long lecture on the seed that has to be planted and, it, you know, and nurtured. And, it, and then it grows, and then one day it's harvested. Poof, it's taken up uh, mm. in resurrection. Mm -hmm. But it's all about the seed. And the idea of the new birth in Christ Jesus is, is the redemptive idea that is interwoven with this whole topic we've been talking about today. And by the way, I'm holding here <clears throat> a uh, package. Uh, Russ Dizdar, L.A. Marzulli, Gary Stearman. It's called Giants, the second annual Nephilim Mounds Conference, uh, revealing the agenda of the fallen cherub. And I think the fallen cherub is behind this whole Absolutely, business, no doubt. including the cover-up, yeah. right? Yep, absolutely. There's, it, it's an agenda. He has an agenda. 
-hmm. trying to suppress the information, keep it from the people. And we, and you say, well, you know, that's nonsense. No, it's not nonsense. What, what happened to that nine foot skeleton that Ralph Gooden found yeah. in 1928 on the island of Catalina? Why can't we see it? Where's that giant that you said, you know, your friend driving through Arizona? And I'm familiar with those stories. There's another one in Kansas, yeah. the same type of thing. They used to be there in the 50s, early 60s. Now they're all gone. Why is that? Why can't we look at this stuff? What are they afraid of? Well, L.A. speaks on uh, giant bones, giant cover-ups, ancient megalithic structures, uh, the UFO breeding program. Are the Nephilim here today? Good topic. We're going to extend that, by the way, in a further conversation. Russ talks about uh, backbreeding the Nephilim, supercharging DNA. You know, talks about what the Nazis were trying to do, the Golden Dawn Society, the Thule Society. It's exactly what they were trying to do. And, of course, my, uh, my two presentations, what is a giant, according to Scripture? And it's all about the seed, the story of the seed of the serpent versus the seed of the woman. It, it, boy, what a story. And there's eight hours of pre over eight hours of presentations along with, I think, what, a two-hour question and answer period at yeah, the end? something like that. Yeah. So a lot of information. Uh, offer this. This is the Giants 2 DVD set. And by the way, uh, we're offering this to you for fifty nine ninety five. the Giants 2 DVD set. The Giants 2 DVD set, fifty nine ninety five. dollars Now, all, as we always do, we put a little something with it. Uh, we have... Uh, this DVD set, uh, L.A. Marzulli, Russ Dizdar, this is Giants Hiding in Plain Sight, the first Nephilim Mounds concert, uh, concert conference. You've got me doing it now, L.A. Okay. <laughs> I feel better, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and we're putting this together as <laughs> the Nephilim package. Both DVD sets, <clears throat> which, by the way, let me just do this right. Both DVD sets plus the free copy of Zenith. 2016 for only $99.95, and you just ask for the Nephilim package. That'll get you both DVD sets and the book, Zenith 2016. If you don't have this book, you can get it absolutely free when you order the Nephilim package. If you just want the Giants 2 DVD set, that's $59.95. Hope that's clear, and uh, all you have to do is call the 800 number on your screen. L.A., we're going to continue this uh, discussion in another program and get more into uh, some of the very exciting visuals that you presented. Sure, absolutely. And, and by the way, that's one of the beauties of receiving these DVDs. You can see the visuals that he presents in his talk and, and really get an idea of some what really what good we're, PowerPoint pictures. It's yeah, great. PowerPoint pictures. You want to see that giant skeleton uh, on uh, the island of Catalina, well, you're going to see it in the DVD set. Well, good talking to you. Likewise, Gary. And let's get together again soon. Absolutely. I'm Gary Stearman. Keep looking up, everybody. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews. Hi, Gary Stearman here. Time for another edition of Prophecy in the News. Today's special guest, L.A. Marzulli, and we've got something important to share with you today. And I do mean important. L.A. Marzulli, good to have you here. Great to be here, Gary. Thanks. You know, you're carrying a kind of a burden these days. Uh, we have followed L.A.'s travels. You've shared your adventures with us. You've gone to Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, uh, the Bible refers to the Nephilim. And let's start our story right there because we've got a lot to talk about today. Sure, ab absolutely. And, and it, what was great about the conference is the way your presentation sort of anchored the, the conference. I mean, and you did it from a, a biblical perspective, and it was, it was almost an exhaustive presentation. What I mean by that is you really covered so much material, and you only had two hours, but you covered just a wealth of material and presented it in such a way that people could see that 
my gosh, this is sort of the key to end time prophecy in a way. And you enabled Russ to take off from your, your platform. And King of nations, four Gentile kings. Well, does that ring a bell? It does. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. This mm -hmm. is a foreshadowing of the prophetic history of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Those four Gentile kings decided that they wanted to come down along the Jordan River, and they came down along the east side of the Jordan River, L.A., on a mission mm -hmm. to capture the land. And in the sixth, uh, well, the fifth verse, let me read that. In the fourteenth year came Kedarlaomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth Karnaim and the Zuzim. And I was able to take off from what you laid down, so... Was, and the platform uh, really good. basically is this, that there is something in the Bible that's an extraordinarily important topic that's been mostly ignored. And, and let me just give you an example to start with here. Genesis 14, uh, this is the narrative in which Abraham goes to the land mm -hmm. that God showed him. He says, go down there, I've got something I want you to do. And Abraham went, by, at that time he was called Abram. And in, in Genesis 14... Verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Kedilaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, really done what I consider basic research into the genetic Thank history you. of mankind. And your books on the trail of the Nephilim have really basically become classics. But in the process of doing this research, you, you have found yourself coming up against resistance in a lot of ways. Now, we have just come back from Newark, Ohio, uh, where Russ Dizdar, Ellie Marzulli, and myself uh, shared in the presentation of a program designed, to, I, I think, to sensitize people to the idea that there were once giants, 